Well, um, I'll, I'll do it slightly differently with uh, working backwards with an example of what happens when people leave us. Uh, one of our graduates not so long ago was in medical school uh, in Ann Arbor. Six weeks into the program, uh, a guy was teaching human development and he went off into a pro-choice rant. He'd got to a few weeks development and showed a picture and said, and pro-life people make a fuss about this. It's just a bunch of cells at this stage. And he went on for a few minutes and Cassie raised her hand. And he looked up and said, young woman, do you have a question? She said, not a question, but what you have just done is an ad hominem attack on pro-life people, and that is disgraceful in a professor. I think you should apologize. Have you ever heard anything like that in first year university? Uh, the really nice thing that happened was at the end about 40 students came and said well done. And it was the usual culprits, evangelical Protestants and Orthodox Catholics. I was there about six weeks later to give a lunchtime lecture and that group plus the atheists followed me out into the courtyard. It was a nice day. They didn't go to the afternoon classes. I had a Socratic type dialogue with them for about two hours and the next morning the atheist took me out to breakfast. That's what Augustine College does when it grows up a bit. Um, I had a, an email from a dad of one of these students not so long ago and he said uh, I've just done a three-hour journey with my son he was chattering away about things I've never heard of. <laughs> Keep the good work up. And they're connected they're already forming a network and uh, the world is going to be frightened of them because they're articulate, they're passionate and they don't, they're fearless. Uh, so that's what we do. Uh, the, those who have sent their children were mainly doctors to begin with uh, because the only publicity we have is me and until relatively recently my primary audience has been the medical community. So for years I've been talking to uh, doctors, uh, mainly uh, on this continent but around the world. And Americans are wonderful. It gives me an opportunity to make you feel good about yourself for a moment. Uh, I should be in charge of publicity for the US. Uh, New York and San Francisco are not the US that I know. Uh, I spend usually two months a year somewhere in the developing world uh, my travel costs are paid for by Americans and I don't even know who they are. Uh, I know how it started. The first time I did a, a, a weekend conference on my own in the States was at the Billy Graham Center in uh, the Carolinas, uh, something over 20 years ago now. And on, I guess it must have been Saturday night, we were having dinner with uh, an ex-missionary and his wife. And she was a very direct American lady. And she said, I've enjoyed what you've been doing. Uh, it's very rare to hear somebody in this part of the world quote George Herbert in a lecture. Uh, she loved poetry and we shared our favorite poets. And then she said, where were you teaching last? And I think it was the Ukraine. And without batting an eyelid, she said, who paid for that? Only Americans are as direct on these issues. As this. There's nobody else in the world that would do that. And I said, well, not me. I, I, I have four children uh, who have been costing me a lot in education and I'm just a professor. Uh, in fact, a Canadian doctor had paid the bill. He'd been fed up with his church and he'd been putting his tithe in an account and then this opportunity came to go and talk to the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences about why they couldn't run a health system. Um, and she said, does that mean you have requests that you refuse? for lack of travel funds. I said, I don't refuse, but I tell them they have to wait. She didn't say any more, but four weeks later, the director of the Christian Medical Dental Association of the US sent me an email saying, I'm directed to tell you that you uh, are not to refuse invitations for Africa, Eastern Europe, and places like that for lack of travel funds. Uh, a couple have put $6,000 in an account at CMDA for your travel costs and they want you to take your wife with you because you should not go to places like that alone. And they've challenged CMDA members and they will match dollar for dollar for another 6,000. 
I have used that fund several times a year ever since. And about two years ago, I happened to see the list of people coming to a conference, and there were the names of the two we'd worked out must be the, core, the source of this program. And so I said to Sally, we, we'd better work out how much we've taken out of it. Well, we got to the conference, and I managed to get coffee with them, and I said, we know you started our travel fund. Have a guess how much money we've taken out of it over the years. And they guessed 30,000. And I said, nowhere near. It's well over 100. And I have no idea who the donors are. That's, I think, America at its best. Uh, and they'll be rewarded in heaven without doubt. And I only wish they could come with me. I, I try to put some little bit of uh, news about it, because one of the most important things that David Stevens has done for CMDA, and if your doctor doesn't belong to it and is a believer, get him to join. Doctors are going to need all the solidarity they can get in the near future. It's very unlikely that you will have a Christian doctor caring for you at your death because they won't be in medicine anymore if people like. What's the name of Obama's sidekick, uh, the Jewish guy who's now head at, uh, um, Lord Mayor, Mayor of uh, Chicago? Hmm? Rahm Emanuel. Rahm Emanuel. His brother Ezekiel claims to be an ethicist. He wrote a piece in the New England Journal just a few weeks ago that basically was liberal hubris at its highest level and basically saying there's no room for people like me in medicine. They want to get rid of us, and they may well do it. Uh, you need to start thinking about that. And it's one of the things, these kinds of discussions will come out of starting a college like this. Um, frightening, the, the state we're in at this stage. So David Stevens was a medical missionary in Kenya for 10 years or more, a one-man mission when he went there. It's now the best teaching hospital in Kenya. I was there last year. And when he came here to run CMDA, he had no idea what to do. He's a very, very smart man who was very undereducated. Uh, I call him a highly educated barbarian. He's fixing it, though. Um, and he does a brilliant thing. He's a very good interviewer. And he interviews people who are Christians active in the public sphere. And I'm on that about twice a year, usually. And so that goes out to 17,000 people. I didn't know the first time he recorded me. He didn't tell me he was going to send the conversation to 17,000 people. I wouldn't have said the things I did if I'd known that. Uh, and in particular, I wouldn't have rec recommended the book list I did. But God knew that, and they needed the book list that I recommended that I wouldn't have had the courage to do. And those guys, and the ones who send their children to us, within a year or two said to me, when are you going to do something for us? And I, in my usual manner, said, well, I've written you off as irredeemable, but you have one thing I need, your money. Uh, how much would you pay? And bless them, they said, well, I'd pay at least $100 a day for golf during holiday times. Why wouldn't I pay you the same amount? And could you get me CME credits? So we do that. So we do a one-week program. If you want to taste it for yourselves, uh, we do a one-week program in June every year, first or second week. Uh, Ottawa at that time, the snow is gone. It's beautiful. Um, uh, the, the temperature's <coughs> more pleasant than here at that time of the year. And we, people become very addicted to us. We've had uh, people come for 13 years in a row. Um, and we take our eight-month program, break it up into modules. It takes about 10 years to get through it. We've got six people who went all the way through once and started again immediately. They said it's even better second time through. Uh, so th the hunger that is out there is real. Uh, and basically, it's like pouring water out in the desert. And th the really good news is I get the longest question periods in more liberal audiences because Christians are living lives of somewhat quiet desperation. Non-Christians are living lives of non-quiet desperation. And we need to tap into it because we have the answers and they don't. So it was out of that kind of recognition uh, that the college was born. And it's, very, it's not a liberal arts program. It's a program designed to strengthen the souls of young people so that they can go out into the trenches and fight. Uh, and 
if we had educators evaluate our program, they would say they would not accept it. In my course, for instance, the first 10 minutes uh, of every, every session begins with the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is, has been a central text in my life. And the first year, the students just got bits of it. And then they said to me, you need to do all of that. So I've been doing it ever since. Uh, it takes me three hours to do the Sermon on the Mount now because uh, I was in the doldrums and I read Bonhoeffer's comment in Life Together saying that when your faith is in the doldrums, you need to ask God for a passage of scripture from him to you in a personal way. Just add it to your prayers and he will bring a passage of scripture into your life in a way you can't deny. Then you read it until it comes to life. And in fact, the Sermon on the Mount is the ground out of which the college grew. Um, on a trip to Africa, I read The Closing of the American Mind, and I think the thesis of that book is that modern students are biblically illiterate, therefore they cannot understand their own language because the metaphors of English literature, are all from, so many of them, are from the Bible. And they don't know what they mean. For instance, there's an 18th century poem that has the line standing amid the alien corn in it. Not one in a thousand English students will recognize what that means. If you don't get the whole story of Ruth from that phrase, you're biblically, biblically illiterate. Uh, and I said when I got back in a biochemistry lecture to the students, if Bloom is right, you're an ignorant bunch. And they complained. There's 20 of them after the lecture were angry with me and said, you've no right to call us ignorant without knowing. I said, I didn't say I, I didn't do it, Alan Bloom did. And he's not here to attack, but why don't we do the experiment? And without thinking, I said, tell me, you all think the Sermon on the Mount is great teaching, tell me what it says. And they knew absolutely nothing. I said, do you? He's right. And then bless them, they said, what are you going to do about it? And initially I said, nothing, it's your problem, not mine. Uh, and they said, but you claim to know things we don't, why don't you teach it? And so I said, well, what you need is an Agnostics Anonymous group because you don't even know the questions, let alone the answers. And they said, that's right. So AA was born on the spot. And I taught it as an extracurricular course for the next few years. And the only prerequisite was that you couldn't claim to be a Christian. And I got 25% of the class. Uh, I hadn't recognized that benefit when I set out. And it was really very, very enjoyable. And I, but as I walked away, I realized I couldn't pass my own test. If you're meant to be a professor, nobody should want to be a professor. Uh, you need to be asked to do it. Uh, because if you go after it and you're not made for it, it's a, it's a crown of thorns. But if you're made for it, it's not. I mean, Lewis used to walk into his lecture. As the porter opened the door, he started his lecture with his booming voice. And the last word was spoken as he went out of the door. It was continuous, no breaks. Um, and he didn't need notes. Uh, you don't need notes if you're a professor in the areas you know. So I used to go to lectures sometimes when I was bored with the wrong notes just to see if I could get away with it. They never knew. Uh, that's the way it is. Uh, but I couldn't do that with our Lord's Longest Sermon. So I read it, I learned it, and then it came to life. And all the students go away with it very deeply ingrained. And actually, if I was a pastor, it would, I would spend the first six months on the Sermon on the Mount in any church because it is about the difference between a mere believer who is using their faith as a kind of divine insurance policy and a disciple. And disciples have better lives. Uh, and it's profoundly countercultural. I mean, the opening, blessed are the poor in spirit, I translated, blessed are you when you achieve real low self esteem, because that's the truth. And he says, the conclusion he draws from it is amazing. And you have the kingdom. You don't know it yet. But he knows that if you become addic addicted to truth, to the level where you face the nasty realities in your own soul, you're going to get to Christ, because that's the only place to go. And you don't need to memorize the Beatitudes, because they are naturally sequential. Each one follows from the previous one. The next one being, blessed are those that mourn. And I think this is repentance. 
Lewis's lovely line at the end of the first chapter of Mere Christianity where he says, repentance is not something God demands of you, but simply a description of what coming to God is like. If you haven't known repentance, you haven't been in God's presence. It's the entry ticket. Did anybody who had a close encounter with God in the Bible start singing happy songs on the spot? It's not what happens, is it? It's flat on your face. Uh, and we don't have that experience often enough. And meekness is probably the one that comes back to me most often. I had just a few weeks ago in California, I was speaking to a, a group about this size in a doctor's home. Uh, and the last person to come in was a young woman who was full of energy. Uh, she turned out to be a surgeon. And she said, good, I'm in time. And uh, I was standing there. She said, I haven't seen you for 10 years, but I think of you every day I go to work. I said, why? She said, you taught me that blessed are the meek means blessed are you when you wake up in the morning and say to Christ, ride me into battle today. Because the word transla that's translated meek is also used to describe a horse that has been broken in and trained and is ready to go into battle. What a wonderful metaphor. And she says, it's an especially wonderful metaphor for going into the Department of Surgery. So she gets out of her car every morning and says, Lord, ride me into battle today. Um, that, that base uh, led to me being introduced to a philosopher in the university via, as usual, elderly women who know what's going on in a city. Uh, one of them called me and said, I hear you're doing things to the Sermon on the Mount. And I said, put that the other way around and you'd be nearer the truth, but yes. Uh, and she said, will you come and teach our adult Sunday school class? I thought it was a liberal church. And in some ways it was, but she wasn't. And I said, I need at least four weeks. And she said, fine, done. And I went. And after the first session, my good friend Graham Hunter, a great big six foot X inches, X, was a heavyweight boxer at university, now a philosopher, uh, came up to me and shook my hand vigorously. He said, I came because I wondered what on earth a biochemist and a pediatrician was doing teaching the Sermon on the Mount. But I enjoyed that. Can we have lunch together? So we started having lunch together, uh, moaning about the state of the university, uh, which is what every academic does if they actually sit and think about what the administration is doing. And then uh, after a few weeks, the Holy Spirit, I hope, uh, got on our case and said, there are others like you in this university. And we could only think of two. One is David Jeffrey, now at Baylor. Uh, I consider him the, the best evangelical intellect on the continent. Uh, speaks nine languages. When he went to Princeton, they said, do you want to do physics or medieval English? And he did medieval English. Um, rode rodeo to put himself through school. Um, an amazing guy. Uh, he brought another one, Dominic Manganiello, who's an expert on Dante. Then, lo and behold, John Paul II's canon lawyer was in the university, and we didn't know, but somehow he turned up as well. Uh, Edith Humphrey, who now teaches at the Presbyterian Seminary in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Tom Wright trained theologian, she turned up. Ed Blado, who is a classicist, speaks N languages. Another guy is another classicist who speaks even more languages. And we had a group, and we started talking. We'd all had the same experience of watching young people arrive at university with a faith and depart without one. Standard phenomenon. It had happened to most of us. In my case, I had a 20-year journey. I didn't cease to believe. I don't think many of us cease to believe, but we cease to practice. Uh, and it sort of goes into deep hibernation. So much so that I was pro-choice for a while. Um, and then slowly, God, in his grace, brings you back to life again. And so we said, we don't need a, a reading group, a, a Bible study or a prayer group. We, we need to think about the nature of education. That's what we're supposed to be doing. So we had a reading group, and we read everything we could find on the nature of education, from the Greeks to Alistair MacIntyre. It was an amazing group. The most amazing thing I think that ever happened is we were headhunted five, year, five years before, well, three or four years before we started the college by the Beijing government, believe it or not. Uh, we got this strange email from Hong Kong. It was not part of China at that time. 
and uh, it was some Chinese gentlemen said, we know you meet, and they knew this tiny greasy spoon restaurant in Ottawa. We know where you meet for breakfast. <laughs> Uh, and we want to take you to breakfast at the Novo Hotel down the street because we want to talk to you. Uh, we're recruiting. We, well, it was a nice breakfast, so we said yes. Uh, and when we got there, uh, we said, what's this about? And they said, we're recruiting for teachers in China. And we said, well, you've come to the wrong place. We're all Christians. They said, we know that. That's why we're here. We said, that doesn't make any sense. They said, it does. Have breakfast and we'll explain. Would that we had governments as sophisticated as the, the, the Beijing one at this level anyway, or some people there anyway. Um, they said, you, remember this is 25 years ago. They said, remember, you think in the West that we are backward technically and economically. We will fix both those problems. That isn't our major problem. Our major problem is corruption. And that's not so easy to fix. But they'd done an analysis that our faculty of education wouldn't be capable of. They said, we realize that what made the difference for you cannot be transmitted as formal ethic lectures in 20-year-olds. That's a waste of time in terms of making them ethical. Ethics are put into you in childhood in some way. So we know it's related to the stories that children read or have read to them when they're quite small. But we can't read them properly because we realize there's a subtext to it that comes from the Bible in some way. So the person they wanted was David. And we have a picture somewhere of David sitting on the, the platform in the University of Beijing and they had brought all their early child childhood education experts from all over China to him. He didn't have to go to them. The Chinese government brought them to him. And over the top, the Bible in English literature. Amazing. And of course, in the crowd, some Christians were there. And they used the opportunity brilliantly. Every day, they would bring a different translator to David and ask him to explain a metaphor. And of course, it was always about the cross. So they got to evangelize all the translators. <laughs> and he's been doing it for 20 years. He's an honorary professor in the University of Beijing. Uh, a few years later, a guy turned up who'd been teaching in China, and he said, I, I had to come and find you guys. And uh, we said, why? He said, David's CDs are all over China. David said, I don't make any. He said, of course you don't. But haven't you seen the women in the front row with string bags? <laughs> it, that, that's China. Would that we were as alive as that. And liberals are realizing it. Have any of you read Niall Ferguson? You should. Uh, I mean, he's a trendy liberal in many ways. But in his book, Civilization, and the subtitle, only a trendy liberal could get away with it. Christian wouldn't be allowed to do this. It's called Civilization, the West and the Rest. I mean, how politically incorrect can you be? But he can get away with it. I mean, he, he married a woman who ran away from Somalia. So... Uh, He's perfect, you know. Uh, and he has his own television program and goodness and what. And at the beginning, he has what he calls the apps of civilization. And they're a boring list, all the ones you'd expect, you know, property rights, uh, the rule of law, education, medicine. I knew. He wouldn't write a book if that's all it's about. So somewhere in this book, there's a gem. And you don't find it until about three quarters of the way through. He goes to China. And he has... He's talking to two academics who are still working on this topic. Because uh, I don't know when he went to China, but we had the same conversation many years before this. But they'd been hired by the government to research this further. They wanted to be certain that they'd worked out what made the West work. And they said, we thought it was your military, but it wasn't. We thought it was this, we thought it was that. It's your religion. They can't understand why we are trashing our faith base because it's essential and they know it. And you can get at your students very easily um, by asking them a few questions. One of the best ones is, well, what do you mean by freedom? And they will say, the freedom to do what I wish. And then you say to them, there's a better definition, the freedom to do what you ought. Because everybody knows what they ought to do. One of the most 
important passages of scripture for me. Uh, I, I'm now, you know, carefree at my age. <laughs> what can they do to me? Nothing. Uh, but I do say very politically incorrect things in very liberal universities. But the text that I think is the one that would, should encourage you all. Do you remember what Jesus says about the, sermon, uh, about the, the Holy Spirit in John 16? He says, when the Spirit comes, he will do three things. What are they? Convince the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So I don't have to do that. The Holy Spirit's going to do that. So I assume in arguing with these liberals that those categories exist. Now as good debaters, what they ought to do is say, I don't accept your categories. No one has ever said it. I guess it's because they're arguing with the Holy Spirit and you don't win that one. I don't know, but it, that's the way it works. Because down deep, we know these things. And I don't think we make enough of this. We, we have allowed scientific reductionism to come right into the heart of the church. We teach evangelism as though it's propositional. But it's much deeper than that. It's not propositional at all, really. You don't become a Christian by accepting a, a confessional statement or a, a set of premises. You become a Christian because the Holy Spirit brings to life what was previously a dead fact. What Jesus said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus wanted to be like Jesus. That's a good thing to want to be, uh, but for the wrong reasons, almost certainly at that stage. And Jesus said, gives the classic non-answer of all time. He says, you cannot get where you want to go from where you are now. It's a sort of Irish response, isn't it? Uh, he says, until you are born of the Spirit, you cannot see, you cannot understand. Uh, and we don't, we don't celebrate the mystery and the amazing nature of conversion. So under, not surprisingly, the young people are not so excited as they should be when it happens. Your conversion cannot be written down in an explanatory way, not the modern way of explanation. It could be written more easily in the older four causes. I mean, the ancient world thought more deeply about these things than we do. When we give accounts, they're reductive. And the two bits that disappeared around the 13th and 14th centuries of the four causes, you know, the formal, the material, the efficient, and the final, the matter, the idea, the tools, the purpose. Purpose was cut out. Uh, because what happened with Occam is we went from quality to quantity. And it was a hugely profitable move for science. Science had gone nowhere from Aristotle. We had to get rid of Aristotle because he valued his mind, which was obviously a very good one, so much that he didn't bother to do experiments. Uh, it was obvious to Aristotle that things fell in proportion to their weight. Well, they don't. But he didn't bother to do the experiment. And his mind was so powerful, everybody bent the knee. When Galileo got his telescope, some people refused to look through it because they said no one could produce a machine or a a tool that could deny the divine Aristotle. <laughs> what you see through it doesn't matter. And we're very much like that. We, we are trapped in our, our stories, if you like. So we, we in the Protestant church, we came into being in response to a, a very uh, out of control Catholic church, particularly in the 15th century, uh, and we were arguing with one another within the lifetime of the founders of the Protestant Church, right? They couldn't agree with one another very swiftly. Uh, because they were reductionist, because theology always shows the marks of when it was made, when it was written. God doesn't write theology, does he? He is theology, if you like. Um, Jesus doesn't teach much theology. Uh, so Catholic theology was written when power over nature was minimal, so the element of mystery is much more apparent in Catholic theology than it is in ours. We wrote it, or it was written, when Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler and Newton were giving us a mechanical view of the universe. And we wanted all the I's dotted and all the T's crossed. So I say, when somebody says sola scriptura, you should listen very carefully. 
And if you have very good ears, you can hear in the background somebody saying, and we'll tell you what it means. Uh, that is what's happened to us, and we need to get back from that. If quantum physics had come earlier, uh, it would have been very different, wouldn't it? Robert Spitzer puts it beautifully, he says, there's lots of room for prayer in quantum physics. I mean, the world conforms itself to what you're looking for. It's amazing. Uh, we talk about these things in this kind of way, and the kids love it. They come to life, and they start reading, and they do much better than we do. <laughs> Just to, I make sure that every student who takes my class knows what reductionism is and what it can do well and what it does very badly and when it should be hammered down and when it should be used. But then they get to me and point out how much reductionism there is in my life. Because I taught nutrition. That's a very reductionistic idea. God made food, not nutrition. Um, good point. I, I liked it. Now, that's a very wandering around attempt to give you some sense of what happens. But what happens is faith gets deeper, and that's what we intend to happen. A liberal arts course doesn't necessarily do that, and that has to be the difference. That's why it's essential that everybody who teaches in the course agrees to that idea. Believes, in our case, we say you must believe the Apostles' Creed is true without reservation. That allows us to bring in the whole range from Catholic to Pentecostal. Uh, and in every group, there are people who really believe. Um, and it's very interesting as an academic that, that when you meet at conferences, you realize that guy over there is Christian when you're in small groups. And it might take a day or two to find out what sort of Christian. The best place to do that, I don't know if any of you had the privilege of going to any of the Liberty Fund uh, conferences. They're superb. It's uh, some rich lawyer in Indiana who put his money into uh, a very interesting project. Where, uh, there's a fixed number, I think it's nine every time. And they take you to a five-star hotel for three or four days, and that's nice. And all you have to promise to do is read two thick books. And then you sit around the table and talk about it, and they always bear on the issue of liberty. Uh, and uh, I've been to a couple of them, and uh, on both occasions I knew that one of the guys was a Christian, and he knew that I was, within you know, about 10 minutes of sitting around the table. Uh, one of them turned out to be Catholic, and he was amazed that I was a Protestant. <laughs> so that's the way it is. Um, we need to cultivate that sense of who we are. And it, it, it is a hugely valuable thing, and it shows up in the, the students in that they become friends for life. And we all, we're, the, our young people are going to need friends that they can trust. You have less people in your life that you could trust than your parents' generation did. And your children's generation will be even worse in that direction, unless we start building the Christian community, which we can do. We, we have a lot of brothers and sisters in places we don't expect to begin with, and we've got to be more aware of that. So, any questions? What questions does anybody have about <laughs> college is or its purpose? So, how, how would you get started? Let's say you've got by the time we'd done that five years of reading, we, we knew that what was needed was to put a history told on purpose. And that purpose was to show them that our, how as Christians, we had no reason to be ashamed of our contribution to the development of the world. Uh, most people have no idea that the names that they use and revere in their work Many of them were deeply committed Christians. The usual one, example I give, Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, Newton, Boyle, Faraday, Clark, Maxwell, Eddington, every one of them a believer. Three of them evangelicals. Clark Maxwell, perhaps the most important of them all, was a member of the Plymouth Brethren. Uh, people don't know that. We, we have an incredible... Um, 
what's the word I want? Ancestors? Uh, not in marital terms, not in re reproductive terms, but in terms of the faith. The, one of the things that if your children do come, and I hope if, if you start a college you will do what we did, which is one of the things that happens every year, is we read the confessions, Augustine's confessions together. Uh, and young people are appalled that nobody in their church has ever introduced them to this. I mean, the book is worth buying for the first page. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. That comes from Augustine's Confessions, page one. Uh, it's an amazing book. He gets this close to quantum physics at one point. And when he talks about memory and things like that, he's stunning. And I think if he came to, to Earth again, he'd be a Protestant, actually. that you want to come and that you can write sentences. We will do the rest. We have no interest whatsoever in the grades that come out of high school because it's becoming more and more a, a memorize and dump program. University's the same at undergraduate level, isn't it? Until we uh, allow students to take exams with their computers on their desk, it will only get worse. Since they're going to practice for the rest of their life with the computer on the desk, why, sh why shouldn't they take their exams that way? I mean, you couldn't imagine, I remember, the, the, I did neurology in Oxford, and that was the height of uh, logical positivism. Uh, but there was a famous exam one year, I've forgotten the name of the guy who was the heart of logical positivism at Oxford, but somebody will probably remember, it doesn't matter anyway, but his question that year, if you, did, you got to the final exam in, in philosophy, there was one question on the paper. Is this a proper question? It was, all, it was all about words, of course, and you had to write for three hours. One guy sat there for about ten minutes, picked up his pen, wrote one sentence, handed it in and walked out. And A.J. Eyre, who was, was, realized he was thoroughly beaten when he read it and he got honors. He wrote, yes, if this is a proper answer. <laughs> <laughs> now, today, with the education and their right. metrics and everything, you couldn't possibly have an exam like that, could you? But you know a guy who could do that, he's going to make contributions wherever he goes. There's a mind there that is out of the ordinary. Two standards? No, five standard deviations from the mean. Uh, my boss wrote, his, by accident, his final exam at Cambridge on the wrong topic. They still passed him. <laughs> and we would do the same, you know. Uh, we've had some stellar students and uh, they loved it. The brightest student we had of all in, in the 20 years, uh, crazy guy. In, uh, he didn't want to waste time cooking. He got the Canadian food guide, and then he'd take all the dry ingredients, mix them up, stir them, and then take them like medicine. That was <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he, 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 was, he was top at everything, uh, 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 but he loved languages most. So uh, uh, we wrote to Thomas Aquinas, because they have a very good language program, uh, of course, we had no accreditation and said, uh, we sent one of his essays and the brothers loved it. They said, we'd love to have him. We can't give him a year's advancement because this is an integrated course, but we'll give him a year for free. So he went to Thomas Aquinas and uh, he loved the brothers and the language. And when he'd finished, he said, now I know I'm a Presbyterian. <laughs> um, we don't have to worry. God puts us where he wants us. Uh, you know, my family now stretches from wild charismatics to miracles happen in Malawi, literally. Uh, there's no, my daughter, who is so naive, I don't know how she got into our family, uh, but she has more than once, they've had, the area she's in has periodic famine, 
and they feed the local area and all the NGOs give them money because nobody else wants to go there. It's over 100 degrees for a large part of the, work, the year and they have no air conditioning. And all the uh, UN vehicles have a, a, a device, I've never found it, but there's a device on UN vehicles somewhere that knows when you've got 50 miles from a decent restaurant. <laughs> uh, and, and they immediately turn around and go back. Uh, so they put all the money through Joanna and David because they know it will get to the end point. Anyway, uh, across the border in Mozambique, it's a long way from anywhere and they get left out. So when they fed the Malawians, they put the food in the back and go over. And more than once they've arrived in a village they didn't know about with insufficient food. And Joanna, I, <laughs> I don't know if this is tempting God, but she doesn't see it that way. Uh, she, they put the food in a big pot and she brings the children forward and says, is there enough for everyone in the village? No. And then she tells them the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And she says, do you think Jesus can still do that? And they say, yes, of course, they're children. She says, let's hold hands and pray. And they feed the village. She's done it twice. <laughs> so that's one end of our family. The next one is a dull Presbyterian, and you need dull Presbyterians. They're very reliable, <laughs> as honest as the days long. Uh, uh, the next one uh, is an evangelical Catholic uh, because they have nine children and they couldn't stand Protestants saying, don't you know about contraception anymore? <laughs> and the Catholics never say that. Uh, the church they went to first, I knew the, the priest because, and he knew me because I ran a clinic for children with incurable diseases of horrendous dimensions. And I, I met him for the first time in the car park when I went to, I don't know which ceremony it was in their church. And I said, you must be Bob Bidar. I said, you're John Patrick. And I said, I have so many people who say they couldn't deal with their lives without you. And he said, I have the same people, only they say they couldn't deal without you. We, we were on the same page, just lovely. And he, he, when you listen to him, uh, you thought you were listening to a Pentecostal, except that the vocabulary was too good. Um, that was the only clue that was left. So that's the next one. And uh, I mean, their house is permanently on, on the edge of total entropy, uh, but it's full of love. The next one, uh, the last one, is uh, a reformed Presbyterian. Uh, it was a dissident Anglican, uh, and he has five children and is a professor of stochastic analysis. So uh, th we have quite an interesting crowd. Family gatherings are fun, uh, but we need to get together. I, right at the beginning of this, I, I ended up with a Catholic lawyer at a Benedictine monastery one night, very tired. We drove up to them, knocked on the door, they took us in, took pity on us, gave us food, sent us to bed. And the next morning, uh, the abbot and his brothers said, let's talk. We had about two hours before we had to go. And it's the best seminar I had had for years. And this lovely man rarely left the abbey, but he knew about me and Ian, and he said, I'm very glad you travel with Ian, you might keep him in order. He knew about his predilection to be unfaithful to his wife, which she did less of when I was with him. Uh, but it, it, the most important thing, he said, we Catholics need you and you need us. I think the Lord is going to winnow the church and perhaps 60% will leave. But what is left will be Orthodox, Catholic, and Evangelical Protestant. I don't know how the Lord is going to bring us together, but that is the church. And it's true. He said, we need you for your passion for evangelism, your love of the scriptures, and you need us, because we've thought about every question you haven't. And that is true. I get lots of emails I can't deal with. I'm twice as likely to forward them to a Catholic as to a Protestant. And I'll have the answer in 24 hours. We have an incredible network now. Every Christian scholar on this continent is connected to every other Christian scholar by no more than two intermediates. It is astonishing. And the liberal world know about it. And they're worried. In the, your Supreme Court is better than ours because of first things. They read the annual review of their deeds in first things, their report, with trepidation. We have nothing like it in Canada. All our judges in the Supreme Court think they invent the law. That's terrifying. There is nothing that they bow the knee to. 
no one. They bow the knee to. Yes. Did you have another question or were you just stretching? No. <laughs> Don. No, I didn't. No, you didn't. You just needed a little stretch. Or. I'll ask one. Yeah. So can you tell me a little bit about the structure? Of, you know, yeah, we, what we did, program. once we'd realized it was history mm -hmm. that we needed to teach, we, we looked at what we'd got available to us. And you start with who God has given you. And we had David Jeffrey, who would obviously teach literature, and he could also teach art. Graham Hunter, he'd teach philosophy. Uh, Ed, Ed Blado was a linguist, and he could teach classical history and Latin. I, I know no history of science. They said, you have to do it. I said, I don't know history. They said, you can do that. We'll help. And... It, it, it was wonderful for me, but I mean, the, the early students, really, they suffered that they don't appear to mind too much. Fortunately, there's a brilliant book, uh, whoever teaches that. Um, David Lindbergh's book, um, The Beginnings of Western Science, uh, University of Chicago Press. It, it's a beautiful book for, uh, it's really a graduate's level book, but uh, uh, it's superb. For, for you, by the way, if you want to, to, to have a, a quick understanding of just how important Christianity has been to science. Uh, Rodney Stark's the best person to go to, I think. The book for the glory of God and the chapter called God's Handiwork. Basically, he didn't know about the historians of, uh, of uh, science. Uh, who've been, who, if you've asked them in the last 25 years, they, they would not agree to the war between science and faith. They would say something like this. It is not true that there has been a war between science and faith. What is true is that the church was not a perfect patron of science, but it was the only patron of science. Experimental science actually could only happen in a theistic society that believed in a God of order, because it's not based on hypothetically, hypothetical deductive systems as they want you to believe, because they know the truth leads to God. It's an inductive system for God's sake, and we need to insist on that. And you can only believe in an inductive system if you believe in God. And that's the story that needs to be told. And Stark's book is it's a lovely book. He was led to faith through his interest in the sociology of religion. That's what happens. It's a good way to come. So uh, those are the uh, literature, of course, is easy. There's, all, there's people around this room now, all of whom have favorite authors. So you just need somebody to coordinate it and give it some sort of order. And there's even a guy over there who teaches English. So he could, uh, you know, wield a big stick and say, no, Dante has got to be there, and a few other things that they don't want to do that have got to be there, and then let other people go. Um, there's so much material. That's the only problem. Uh, to, to do it in a year is very broad brush. Uh, but... It, it works. It works. Does that help? It does. Uh, although, could you be a little bit more specific on the major categories? Science, Science. Math, math, medicine, that's one. And I insist that, it, uh, I, that faith is there as well. Yeah, of course. Oh, not of course. I have trouble with persuading people of that. <laughs> uh, not much trouble, but they, 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 they look askance at it. Uh, the arts, literature and, philo and philosophy, Latin, because it makes you more logical. It's a logical language. We actually also teach a short course on classical logic because it's not taught anymore, so that they know when an, uh, an argument is proved and not. Um, we do have a, a course on scripture, of course, and we do one on the history of faith. But you could, if we, occasionally we have people who can do music, so we'll add that as well. Uh, if people come along, uh, you teach it. If they go, you don't. I mean, it's God's, I look upon it as God's project. So I have to take what he sends. And sometimes he does it in amazing ways. The guy who teaches philosophy came to us because of a case of mistaken identity. I can't recruit because I have no money. Uh, I can't say to anybody, come and work for us. We, we, we say, come, and if you can survive, good luck to you. Uh, we will pay you an honorarium per lecture, basically. Uh, anyway, uh, he, this guy wrote me uh, a note about something I'd written, which is a nice note, and uh, I saw his name, and I, I, I tend to scan emails, as you probably do too. There are too many of them. And uh, I just wrote a note back saying, thank you for your nice comments. Uh, 
I'm going to be doing some lectures at McGill uh, quite shortly. We haven't met for ages. Can we have coffee together? And back came another one. He said, I think you've mistaken me for someone else. <laughs> and I had. I thought he was a lawyer who had the same name. But he was a guy who uh, wanted to be a philosopher, had a PhD in philosophy, but he got a PhD in philosophy when you only got a job if you were female, handicapped, and black. Uh, he got a folder this thick of polite refusals, where on occasions women had been appointed with no teaching experience and no publications over him. You know, he was somewhat bitter. He made his living because he has an encyclopedic knowledge of art and he wrote uh, brochures for art exhibitions. And the contracts had just dried up. So when I met him, he was just about to go on welfare, which really was hurting him. He didn't want to do that. And when he heard about the college, he said, oh, I'd love to teach there. And I said, I don't need a teacher at the moment. It does happen that our administrator has just left. It has a very small salary attached to it. He said, I'll do it. And he moved to Ottawa. And then Graham Hunter, our professor of philosophy, was asked to run the department in the university. And he thought he'd done his term with Augustine. And so he resigned. And he, said, he sent us a young man who said, he fits the criteria. But he didn't. Unfortunately, by the end of the term, I had a meal with him and he said, I know you want me to leave, and I, I should because I don't fit here. Mm. And I said to Edward, you're going to teach philosophy. And he has become the most important teacher in the college because oh, no undergraduate gets lectures like his. I mean, he, he, he cares about every word. Uh, I don't think he, when he gave his first lecture, I don't think he slept for two nights before it, you know. It, it is... Uh, he loves philosophy and... His lectures are unbelievable. He's the yeah. only person in the entire world that I think should be allowed to use PowerPoint. Yeah. Once you've seen his PowerPoints, you'll never do one again. Yeah. Because I think he spends about three hours on each slide. <laughs> because the, each slide is an art project. Yeah. And... It, he doesn't use PowerPoint the way it should be used. Uh, it is not a good idea for information. Because people who are obsessive compulsive are obsessed about getting it all down. And even when you send them the PowerPoints afterwards, they're still looking at the PowerPoint and not following the argument. What Edward Tingley does is he finds an art icon of some sort for what he's talking about. I mean, his lecture on moral relativism opens with a photograph taken in Prague with six civilians strung up and lynched by the Nazis. That's moral relativism. The Germans had come in, the, the Czechs had killed an SS officer, so they strung six civilians up at random. They don't forget that. Yes? Why Blacksburg? I came here first after the, the massacre. Uh, Ty invited me. Uh, the day after it happened, I think. Uh, normally, uh, it, was, it was an amazing event from my point of view. Uh, this time of year, up until about June, uh, I'm normally away every week. And that particular year, my wife, who tells me where I'm going next, said, you've got a week off this year. That's nice. Or maybe there's something you're going to do. <laughs> and, I forget which day of the week it was that it happened, but anyway, uh, it was just right. Ty called and said, are you by any chance free? And I said, yes. And he said, get on the next plane. And he bought the tickets. And uh, I gave one or two talks every other day, every day, I think. And uh, uh, what? Three talks. Uh, and some others. I did one with the medical students, which I forgot about, which he reminded me later. It's been an, an important event in my life, so I have a very soft spot for Blacksburg. I enjoyed the week, uh, and two things came out of it. One, only this year, that just a reminder of how important it was. Um, I also spoke to the medical school, and uh, I must have. Uh, given them a talk that I give sometimes uh, on getting married and having children and starting it while you're in medical school because if you wait longer you'll be infertile before you think you're ready. Um, 
And uh, about three years later, Ty called me and said, I have a special Bible study group uh, and they want to see you. Uh, he wouldn't tell me what it was about. And when I got there, I think there were six couples there with children and they held me philosophically responsible for those children. But they weren't complaining. Uh, what? There's about 50 kids out of that now. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> Including yours. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot that's come out of this and just this year uh, I had an email from a retired VT prof and I've forgotten his name I'll find out and send it to you when I get home um, but it said um, I heard you that week on Saturday morning at the Blacksburg there was a men's breakfast somewhere he said yeah, yeah. Uh, he said uh, um, I hadn't heard anyone like you before. He said you spoke for, he said three hours, so I'm sure it wasn't, but a long while anyway, <laughs> without notes. And he said I was baptized two months later. He wasn't, uh, uh, you don't get emails like that every day, but I get them quite frequently now. That's lovely, that's the way it should be. And then Ty said, come and do another trip. Because uh, I've said to him, this needs to be cloned. It's cheap. And it, it can, I think it could renew the church. It can be done in every university town. And you have a much better starting group than we had. We just had six profs. Uh, we didn't have many uh, ministers who came on board with us. Just a couple, actually. Uh, that's all. We had a pastor's meeting this week, and they were all on board with us. So uh, I think you've got a community here that can do it. Uh, don't worry about the exact format. The most important thing is not the teachers actually, but the environment that is produced because they talk to one another. Typically they'll say, when we ask them what was the year like, they said, well at the end of the first week we all got together and said we're in trouble, we better work together. Because we don't have any frost week stuff, you start on day one and off you go. And they write about probably 30 assignments in in eight months. I don't even give a mark until the final assignment because I know that the curve looks like this. Uh, up till Christmas they're not sure they can handle it and I say don't worry go home don't talk to your friends who went to a secular university they won't know what you're talking about and then about February they start making connections and then they write these spectacular essays. It's not rare to see homeschooling mums in tears at graduation mm. when they see what, what has happened in eight months. Uh, one of them told me, she said, my son, when he read about it, he said, I'd like to do it, but I don't think, I, I'm not sure I can do it. And she said, he sent every assignment to me before he gave it to you guys. And she said, I couldn't believe what was happening to him. And the whole family followed. You know, we've had, that's typical. Once we get one, we get everybody who's at all academically inclined. This year was a celebration of a family who sent us five over the years. And we had the last one. Can you repeat for us what uh, Rusty Reno said to you about it? Oh, yeah. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in New York and I had dinner with uh, Reno, the editor of First Things. He's been up to speak. We have an annual lecture which is funded by a wealthy family. Uh, we've had Reno, we had Peter Kraft, uh, David. we brought David back from Baylor. We had some really superb speakers over the years. And they are, were, are, they've all been uniformly uh, impressed. We had Jeremy Begbie, who you should have here because he's only a Duke no distance ago. And also this year we had Far Curlin from, from uh, Duke and you should have him here. It, sh it would be a good starter because uh, euthanasia is going to come to Virginia. Uh, it's unstoppable uh, now. It's going to spread. And he does a brilliant talk on what we need to be doing. I think we need to divide the medical system on a moral basis. We don't disagree about how medicine should be done, but we do disagree about the type of morality that should be there. So uh, uh, I had dinner with Reno and he said, uh, I think you have stumbled on something that's important to the church because it's so cheap the liberals won't go after it because they can't stop us. There's no way they can stop this. 
because we do it in a, a cellar if necessary, you know. And, and they're not going to, they can't bring themselves to admit that this might change things. And he said, send me an ad, I'll run it for you. Uh, and it encouraged me in the idea. I said, with thinking about trying to persuade the people in Blacksburg to try and do it. And he said, he'd come down and talk for you, I'm sure. If I could try to answer the why Blacksburg question. Um, I think we have a couple of key ingredients that kind of make this happen. Uh, I think a lot of us would agree that the need is there. Um, so it ought to be cloned. Uh, there are lots of professors in this valley. Um, there are lots of believing professors in this valley. There is a healthy local church here wherein the churches are actually pretty good at getting along with one another. I think better than a lot of places. Um, there's a really robust homeschooling uh, community here, which I think goes a long ways to kind of carry it yeah. forward. Um, it's cheap here. So housing students here is way cheaper than housing them in Ottawa. Mm. Um, it's a nice place to live. It's not, you know, if we wanted to do this in Fargo, North Dakota, the North Dakota, <laughs> nobody wants to move there, right? Well, that's not true. <laughs> well, it's oil business, yeah. right? it's Fargo. That's not true. <laughs> I spent five years in Iowa. Oh. I like Iowa fine. I'm just telling you, it's easier to get people to move to a place like this. Yes, <laughs> I can see that. What's your thought of, of having a pilot program just to get started? Something mini, with a few people perhaps uh, voluntarily, voluntarily uh, giving lectures on particular areas um, and giving people a taste? Well, we did it once for, for five students for one year. That would be, we, we had five students one year, but we still carried on. Um, our average has only been... What? You were all, all, all five of you were full time. Yeah, yeah, well, we only teach one lecture a week. So in a way, it is a small thing all the while. Um, what would be nicer here is because it's a smaller, more compact place, you'd have more interaction. We often don't see one another very much during the year, and it's a pity, but we have lives to live and get on. I live now 50 minutes from town because I've retired to the country. Uh, I needed somewhere where all my grandchildren could come, you know, there's nowhere in town I could afford. So we live on a farm now and pay the bills by raising trendy beef, you know, um, that's what I do. So uh, uh, yes, you could, the numbers don't matter to begin with because if you're, you're doing it for love basically and you're getting paid in currency better than dollars. In, uh, I got younger. <laughs> I mean, uh, people commented from the university when after I left, they say, you look younger. I say, well, I don't work, I walk normally now. I don't have my back to the wall all the while. <laughs> so it's basically two 13-week semesters. Yeah. There's only one lecture a day. A lecture is really kind of like an... Well, two lectures a day usually. And uh, because we, we try to finish early on Fridays. Uh, Doug actually does a cooking session on Friday as well as scriptures and they, they have chapel on Friday. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Um, I think we would go a long ways if we just found 10 people who would say, well, I'll give 10 lectures during the year. Like that would put together a huge piece of it yeah. there. And I think, I mean, there's 4,000 professors in this valley, right? There are about 100 believing uh, faculty on our mailing list yeah. of Christian scholars. Well, uh, surely the first thing to do is to send a letter around and you've got a core group of people say, are any of you keen enough to want to be part of the experiment? And would you like to teach something that tries to relate your faith to your academic, ex your academic expertise in a way that you haven't done before? And you will enjoy it. Uh, it's such a pleasure. I mean, the first time I gave a lecture and began with prayer, I was almost in tears. I mean, I'd begun lectures with prayer many times, but only silently.
What about other practical questions for discussion like that? About how do we well, you need a location. Some, uh, will the church offer you the, maybe to limit your burden? You don't need to use the same church all the while. You could even share that out too. And I would really, one of the key things is to have a, a weekly meal for the students so that, and other people drop in on it, a community meal. And you could share that around the churches. Uh, the churches would enjoy having young people in their church who are trying to learn to be more effective Christians. Uh, there's something infectious about young people who are enjoying learning, isn't there, as you had today. Uh, you could see what a change. Uh, you should tell them about what happened to you today, because it would enc encourage them, this is what's out there. <laughs> tell us. Um, <clears throat> what am I telling them? No. <laughs> so I teach a vibrations course, um, and I've... I've um, I teach uh, undergraduate vibrations and I teach graduate vibrations and about two years ago I started integrating new homework assignments and, and this year I built up the courage to actually call them character development assignments um, and I make them read articles as well as I make them define things like integrity, honor, character, uh, we talk about morality. Um, I don't know, we, we read articles like the last one that came out to, uh, a few weeks ago, which is the uh, Economy of Cheating, which came out in the Chronicles of Higher Education, about all this business that's online in, in terms of uh, teaching uh, about how online courses are being bought off. Students pay a company, a company comes in with your login, does all your work for you, guarantees you a grade. Um, and we finished the class this, this, so we've been doing this for the entire semester, so they're kind of, at the beginning, they're like, why is this important? And what does this have to do with engineering? And at the end, right, they're irate that something like this is happening while they have to work. So it's a perfect time to go and, and talk about the, the key words in the definition of integrity, moral, and, char and character, which is morality. And then I ask a question like, is, moral, is, is morality relative? you know, a third to two thirds, spending on the semester, raises their hand and says yes. And I say, why are you upset? Um, and then we finish the class with about three slides, uh, which talk about, define those words, challenge the morality concept to be relative, and we talk about worldview. Um, and we finish with how we're all ruled by worldview and how they need to figure out what that is. And I, you know, and I finished my class, I said thank you, it's been a great semester and they got up and applauded. And I didn't know what to do. <laughs> um, so they've been, and then I had 10 of them follow me to my office hours, which we spent about a couple hours trying to deal with what, what that meant. And this will lead to about you know, 10 or 15 coffees, um, and it happens every semester. Yep. So You're not alone, it's happening to other people. Yeah. My Agnostics Anonymous group mm -hmm. is the same. <laughs> no, no. I came in because I need wisdom from John Patrick, but I just got myself into. Um, no, but yeah. I, but uh, you've got people that they they love the fact that we're passionate, and if you care about the student, you care about the subject. You can be very politically incorrect. Mm -hmm. They will. Not, you will be defended by the liberals. Yeah. What they will not tolerate is people who pretend to be politically correct. And you can't keep it up for a year. Your defense will fall and they'll be on you like a ton of bricks. I used to begin my honors biochemistry course every year in a totally politically incorrect uh, way. I would begin by saying, you will find me to be a totally intolerant professor. And you could see the body language immediately. And they say, before you send me off for remedial tolerance 101, I think I can prove that you're intolerant too. And I would say to them, do you know what Nambler is? And of course they didn't. I say, well, look it up. And of course it's the North American Man-Boy-Love Association. And its declared public objective is to make sex between adult men and prepubertal boys an accepted good. And it was founded by a Catholic priest. Uh, and I said, now, here's my thought experiment I want you to do. I want you to imagine in a few years' time you have eight-year-old boys. And you have wished on you as a house guest because of your work, a young man who when he arrives turns out to be a member of Nambla. He's charming, he's funny, he even cooks. He's a very good house guest, except for this statistically unusual view of what should be called normal. Uh, are you going to allow this charming 28-year-old 
uh, to persuade your eight-year-olds that they're missing out on the rights of all eight-year-olds. Stand up, if you will. Of course, nobody moves. And I say, well, welcome to the ranks of the intolerant. I found something you will not tolerate. And we go from there. They don't forget it. And then I point out that tolerance is not even a virtue. It's the oil to make the virtues work properly. That's all. Lewis said a long while ago that most heresy is a good thing in a wrong position. And he's right. Tolerance is needed, but when it gets to the top of the heap, the system won't work. I mean, you can rewrite the Ten Commandments as the Ten Divine Intolerances, can't you? And he did it because he loves us. So you get lots of opportunities to develop these things, and this is a safe environment to do it. And then they go off and do it in their universities. And it's fun to get the stories back. Some of us say, that's a bit unwise. <laughs> they go ahead and do it anyway. But, you know, Texas A&M, one of our graduates is told, leave your ethics in the parking lot. A doctor. That's America. That if we don't stop the rot, uh, there'll be trouble. So I'm sure you're going to get some people who want to do it. I'm sure you can find enough professors. You're not in charge. Don't think you are. It's God's project. That's the most relieving thing of all. I don't worry about it. If he wants to stop it, we don't get any money. If he wants it to go, he brings the money. Uh, and that's happened several times. The first time it happened, three of the members of the, the professors who've been teaching said, look, we always said if we went into the red, that's the end. We're going to go into the red this June. And we ought to close, we ought to plan to close down now. The rest of us said, well, we haven't said our prayers. We should do that. Those three left. We said our prayers. About a week later, a guy called me and said, um, how's your college going? And I said, um, pedagogically, it's wonderful. <laughs> uh, but it's a disaster economically. We're probably going to go bankrupt this summer. And he said, would 25,000 help? I said, who are you? Do I know you? And Why are you giving me 25,000? But it would certainly help. And he laughed and he said, um, well, you don't know me, but my favorite aunt has just died. And uh, she comes from a very wealthy family. And uh, she said, I'm her executor. And the last conversation I had with her, she said, I was just looking at my will and I realized I intended to give some money to a young man in Ottawa. That was me. I love that bit. Uh, he's trying to run a college and I like the idea. Give them a call. Find out if they need help and if they do, give it to them. There's plenty left over. And that got us through that, that time. The next time, alumni started sending me checks for a hundred bucks when they heard we might be going that way. And I, I, a hundred bucks from somebody who's still in school means more than, to me than 25,000 from a millionaire. Uh, uh, and I, I had some very uh, tart emails from people said, don't you ever dare to do this again without telling us that you might go bankrupt. So I know we're not going to go bankrupt again because uh, most of our students come from medical families. Uh, doctors aren't businessmen, but they usually have some. They could afford a thousand every now and again, and they would. They're going to bail us out if we need it. And you will find the same because... Uh, they love us. I, mean, I have never been back, and I suspect most of you have never been back to the institutions that claim they educated you, right? I see no reason to do so. But every graduation, we've just had the 20th, there were, I think, 15 alumni who came to that. Other people's graduation. I mean, I didn't even go to my own. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, be because ours is a church service. And it's deeply moving. I mean, people are in tears. It's beautiful. You, once you start, you, you, won't, you won't worry about it. You've got what it takes. You know, and you've got parents who, if they're reading what's going on in the world at all, are worried about what's going to happen to their children. And a year like this gives them some armor. The kids come, they're presumably housed somewhere. Yep. There's, there's two lectures a day, yep. Thursday. Um, is there 
someone around for them during the day? Or yeah, uh, Edward Tingley lives in, right opposite where we meet. Um, each we have two houses: a, a woman's women's house and a men's house. Each has a, a resident uh, who's you know uh, a few years older than them. Uh, our alumni uh, compete for that job, the RA, um, because they'll come back to Ottawa for any reason at all. Uh, they, it's, it's quite common for them to do some work, contract, earn some money, and then come to Ottawa uh, to use up the money so they can be with us and they'll, you know, work at Starbucks or whatever to make it last as long as possible. They don't want to leave. Because RAs are probably building some of that community and just spiritual environment with them. Yeah, they're doing all sorts of things around the place. And this year we've made a, a very significant step forward because uh, Trinity Western, which is one, one of the two or three Christian universities in Canada, has a leadership training program in Ottawa because of Parliament for people going into politics. And they have a beautiful building and it isn't being used enough and they've begun to feel guilty and they say, we would like you to use our building for your lectures. That will save us money. And there's another reform group that are working in politics who've got some spare space. So they we don't have to rent a lecture room this year. That will save us a few thousand. Um, the last thing before I leave, I, I'm going to, with the help of a, a journalist who's done this twice already, do a kickstart program to see whether we can build, we can get enough money to buy a plot of land and build a very functional residence, male, female, joined by a lecture room and a kitchen. That's all we need. And the only thing I'd be concerned about is that it be very efficiently built so it has low running costs. And uh, I think we have a good chance of doing that. John uh, Robson, my friend, uh, says you'll do it easily because uh, I can get David Stevens to let me use the Doctor's Digest to say we're doing this. That would be, a, that would go to 17,000 people who know my voice. It wouldn't need many of them to get the money we need. If we do that, we're then on a, a less the, the place in a, a much more solid uh, base. And I, in a place like this, you probably don't even need to do that because uh, it seems to me some pastors would say, you can have space in this church, we're not going to charge you for it. And then you don't have the running costs either. You, you, you know, hopefully you'd be able to make some contribution to the church. But you have a community here. Our, our city, you see, has such a high turnover and it's very political. We don't have people get tired of investing in people and then they leave. That's what happens in all political environments. And ours is very political. Yours is an nicer in that sense. Better place to do it. So you're more likely to be the model for future than we are. And the other good thing about Americans is you join. You've got a heritage in that direction that you join things to achieve things. I mean, when you have your celebration of independence, everybody turns up. In, in Canada, we just watch the fireworks, you know. <laughs> John, John, I have a, I have yes. a question about uh, several of us are involved in uh, classical education at the high school. Yeah. And um, a lot of the things you've mentioned sound really familiar yeah. to us. And yes. The kinds of things that we're doing already to some degree. Um, do you have students who come from classical schools, and if so, is there concern about redundancy? Sorry, could you repeat the last bit? I didn't quite catch it. Do you have students who come from classical high schools, and if so, is there concern about redundancy given the reading materials they may already have? Been uh, it's a different world entirely. Uh, we've had several people from classical backgrounds. My third daughter, uh, well two of my children, started a classical school in Ottawa and they want, they're very much on my case to see that the school continues. Um, because going, first year university is lethal. They don't learn anything in the first semester. They lose their mind, their virginity uh, and their faith in random order. It's not a good place. Um, 
so coming to us and then translating that into going into second year is a very good move. And uh, Wheaton, for instance, will will take your graduates. They, they called us in year one and said, where are these kids going? <laughs> we don't know. It's up to them. And they said, we will certainly take them and give them a year's advancement because we know what you're doing. They knew us. And so we do have a small nexus of universities that already know about, well, many know about us. Uh, several Christian colleges have asked us, when are you going to send us students? Roberts Wesleyan and uh, that kind of college would love to have our students, but they don't want to go there. It's not good enough. Houghton gave one of our students two years advance for one year with us. Because um, we worked them hard. My concern is just in terms of exposure, students who spend 12 years or 13 in a classical school already, yeah. then they go to a program like Augusta. Yeah. Are they doing the same thing again? No, no. It's like the difference between driving a go-kart for 12 years and you get good at it and feel comfortable and then you get a 6 or horsepower race car. It's like, yeah, it's still driving around the track fast, but it's a different thing. Yeah. And when you've, like, when you've heard Ed, Ed, seen and heard Ed Tingley do teach philosophy by teaching art history, yeah, you're like, okay, it's a different thing. Go and just go on our website and read what the alumni say. You know, one that comes to mind is a a top student at uh, Southwestern Medical School who came after finishing medical school. And she said, I've done 12 years of higher education. Nothing in those 12 years came close to this year. Another way that I could uh, kind of help you with that is, so I, I, you know, I go up there at the end of their uh, academic year for a week, most years. And so I meet a lot of the graduates, you know, that's 12 years of worth of them by now. I also mentor medical students here, and I've done that for 10 or 15 years. And, you know, medical students are supposed to be pretty sharp people, right? It's like actually hard to get into medical school. Um, <laughs> the graduates of Augusta, like completely, who were five years younger, blow these medical students out of the water when it comes to just the conversations I have with them. Uh, it's, yeah, it's just a whole different thing. It's, it's like moving up to the big leagues. I mean, something happens to you around 17 or 18, especially the guys. The guys don't become serious till that age, really. Uh, that's one of their problems, because they've often loaded themselves with some bad track records for a while. Uh, fortunately, you can cross them out. Relating to that, <clears throat> we're saying it's different than what even very good classical training would be. It's another level yeah. up. And I'm hearing that you know, you're, the professors there are providing that, and the students are having these discussions, these Socratic yes. environment. But those professors who have skills, they develop this mindset mostly through the reading groups. Is that how, how do you both have it? Now, the people who are teaching now are not in the reading group. I'm the last one left from that. Ed Blado came, didn't come to the reading group very much. Uh, so I'm the last one from that era. Reading group doesn't still continue. So how do we develop professors who would be conducting this sort of level that we're saying? Well, have to you do just it? heard one guy has been doing it on his own. He'll only do it better when he talks to other people. Okay. And so that mindset. Yep. The, the, what's so liberating is that you're not bound by an ideology that the university has. The university is tacitly atheistic, and we're not. And of course, many of the, uh, I go to a lot of Christian schools across the continent, and they often make the mistake of thinking they're redemptive. If you have more than a small percentage of your students who are not on board, they will change the ethos of the place. Well, what keeps our place in order is we work them so hard. We've had a few come who were, you know, parents sent them, bullied them into doing it, and they didn't really want, they all leave within a week or two. There's only about 10 altogether in 20 years. We had one atheist who lasted the whole year and became a Christian a year later. <laughs> it does feel like there's something there, just in your, your question, that 
I think we do have a wealth of resources in this yep. valley. At the same time, there's, a, there's we've all been trained in a style that maybe a lot of people don't believe in anymore. So yes. there's, there's something there to learn. Yes. In the community and, and those particularly who are doing the, the uh, education. There's something that, yeah. To read with your students is not something you do very much in the university. Really read with them, you know. And even our students, they say when they've gone, we should have taken more advantage of the fact that we could have talked to our professors even more than we did. Um, first year students never talk to professors, do they? I remember the first time, one of the turning points for me was discovering four lines from the 12th century written by Bernard of Clairvaux that go like this. Uh, some seek knowledge for the sake of knowledge, that is curiosity. I've done that, that's what you do. I played with expensive Lego for many years and persuaded people that uh, uh, they should buy me some more every year and got away with it. Um, the next line was, some seek knowledge in order that they themselves may be known, that is vanity. And from that day on I call my CV my curriculum vanitas. Because uh, you don't read CVs, you weigh them, right? Um, then the next one is there are others who seek knowledge in order to sell it, and that is dishonorable. I've done that too. It doesn't mean making a living, but it does mean making a killing. As an academic, you can do that. Uh, and if you're as cynical as me, you can actually take some malicious pleasure in doing it, you know. Uh, given my interests, uh, some of the work I did had considerable spin-offs, uh, particularly in pediatric hospitals. Uh, and the providers of the milk for a pediatric hospital, that's an important contract. And one of the deals they would say, we'll bring you a good speaker, uh, anything to bribe them into getting the thing. And then I'd get asked to give the talk. And being a cynic, whenever I was asked to do a talk for a commercial agency, the first thing I looked at was the date of the talk. And I really enjoyed it when I saw that it was close. Because I knew they meant they'd invited someone else <laughs> who had bailed out. And really, I, they were at my mercy at that point. I once, I shouldn't have done it, but I needed some money. I bid them up to $10,000 for a weekend once, you know. I mean, that's nothing to Clinton. I think charges half a million a go nowadays, you know, whatever it is. But you shouldn't do that because your soul is damaged. Uh, but I'd done that. But it was the last one that killed me. Some seek knowledge in order to edify others, and that is love. And I didn't even learn, that. I wasn't like you, I didn't even learn the names of my students in my class. When, even though I'd got it down to 20, uh, that was the first, the object of the first lecture of my course was to get the class size down to 20. Uh, I was very good at that. And then, I didn't even learn, I didn't even learn their names. So I went home the, the, the week that I discovered this line, the day I discovered it, and I said to Sally, you know, I, I'm actually feeling guilty. And I told her why, and she said, why don't you bring your class home to supper? And I looked at her and said, would you feed them? And she said, yes, I'd feed them. So they came. And uh, she's an excellent cook. And then we started talking, and they didn't leave till midnight. We didn't do any silly games or anything like that. These were kids from good homes, but they'd never discussed any of the important questions. Where did I come from? Where am I going? What should I believe? What should I do? How do I deal with death, suffering? None of those things. And you get time, when they're a classical school, they're not old enough to deal with many of those things, but by the time they're about to go into university, they are. And I, I, I go through more sexuality, marriage, sexually transmitted disease, the things they've got to know uh, that are never talked about in church. I usually say there are six issues that I don't think are taught in classical schools. And if, you're, if your young people can't deal with these issues, then I have malicious colleagues who will take them apart. Reductionism, relativism, tolerance, multiculturalism, the sanctity of life, and sexual, sexual ethics. They've got to deal with those. Yeah. So do you record these lectures? Yeah. Um, I don't, but other people do. Because uh, a lot of these things you're talking about, I did on my own through YouTube and reading books. Yeah. Maybe not perfectly. But it can be done, yeah, but you're, you're unusual that you, you did that. So you could answer all those questions. Maybe not all of them, but 
Yeah. <laughs> but every youth pastor has to be able to do them. And we do a summer program for docs here. I think you might think about doing a summer program for pastors because it's a cheap place, especially youth pastors. They basically provide advanced childcare in most churches. And the kids will actually respond when you start talking to them seriously. <laughs> Reductionism, relativism, all four forms. Tolerance, multiculturalism, uh, the sanctity of life, and sexual ethics. To attack multiculturalism is, is asking for a lot of trouble. Uh, the first time I did it, I, I've never been invited back to that medical school. Uh, and I did it 20 years ago. But they still talk about the lecture. <laughs> because I began by saying, how many of you think multiculturalism should show up in medicine? And of course, they all raised their hands. And I said, I, I think I can show you that is not true. Um, and uh, this was about halfway through the lecture. Uh, and uh, I said, all I need to do is to tell you one true story that happened to me. And the one thing you can still do in the modern university is tell your own story. And I said, I, I, I saw a little girl. And uh, she had a septic knee that had been neglected. So that by the time she got to me, she was septicemic and dying. Uh, with pus in the, the tibia and the femur. <laughs> the only thing you can do to save a life at that stage is cut off the leg. And I told the parents that we needed to do it quickly and fill her with what antibiotics we had, because this was in Africa. And they said, we need to think about it. I said, well, it will take us 20 minutes to get the OR ready, and then we should do it. Well, in those 20 minutes, they took her home to die, which is undoubtedly what happened. And I was the only person who was horrified. And I said to the nurses with whom I'd done pediatric ward rounds that morning, I said, I'm, not, I'm upset you're not, can I talk to you? And they of course said yes. And providentially I asked the right question. I said, what would those parents have done if this had been a little boy? And you know what they said. Oh, they would have done the amputation. I said, why would you treat little boys and little girls differently? And they said, in our culture, it is a woman's job to till the fields, fetch the water, cook the food, and bear the children. A woman with one leg cannot do those things, so she'll have a life not worth living. We're starting to kill people in the Western world now because we judge that their life is not worth living, not them. And I said, if you're a multiculturalist, you must accept that view of the relative value of little boys and little girls as just as good as the one I hope you have. Do any of you do that? One girl at the back raised her hand. And it was what I said next, which probably I shouldn't, but I shoot from the hip sometimes. Uh, and I said, I'm sorry to see you raise your hand. I suspect you're trying to maintain some form of intellectual integrity, but the next step in that is that you should resign from this medical school and go and see if you can find a pagan one because you are wishing to replace the Judeo-Christian ethics that have run medicine for 2,000 years with pagan ethics, which have never run a hospital. To her credit, she didn't leave, and every time I tell the story, I pray for her. But uh, I was never invited back again. The, uh, the atmosphere in the lecture room was, shall we say, uh, tense. <laughs> But trying to be trying to be practical on how you get this going, how you find the people who are going to teach, how you I mean inevitably there has to be some kind of you know education on you know we do a lot of reading on our own and, and we prepare on our own but well but you, like this needs to you have more. free access to what we do. Mm -hmm. So uh, you don't have to do the same. Sure. But uh, you, it would be a very interesting exercise for you to sit down individually and say, if I was taught, teaching this course, what would I want to do? What would the lectures look like? Uh, they would be different from the ones you've taught in the university because, sure. you'd be, uh, as you've already discovered, instead of having to add it on as a tailpiece, you say, how do I integrate it? How do I weave a new lecture? Uh, that really is worth doing. Um, I gave a lecture today in the medical school, What Hippocrates Knew and We've Forgotten. 
uh, I give that lecture many times a year. But it, it's different every time I do it, but it's integrated, mm -hmm. and it's it's a joy to do it. Uh, and instead of you certainly won't be transmitting information from one piece of paper to a, another through a brain that doesn't stop it en route. Uh, that's not what we're about. And that is a joy. Yeah, you have to work hard to get them to engage because they haven't had the sense of, okay, say something. Um, that's not what we do anymore, is it? Flip, you drop out the vibration. <laughs> what, you like that? I'm just kidding. Do you, have a, we have do you know what? We have an engineering student that wants to, you know, have at it, but, you know what I'm saying, but yeah. the, the other topics that you're trying to in integrate, those would come to the fore. Yeah, absolutely. And then yeah. you would use your own creativity to... Well, yeah, you, you could prepare engineering students to understand why they're doing what they're yeah, doing. Yeah, but, but you'd be doing physics, really. Sure. And Look at the names you've got to run with. Mm -hmm. Do you know that Kepler wrote prayers in his lab book? <laughs> when he, he, he insisted that he did not discover the ellipse, God showed it to him. <laughs> he recalculated Tycho Brahe's data by hand for six years, trying to make it fit a circle. Yeah. And the prayer he wrote gave thanks for the error, I think it was six minutes of arc on the movement of Mars because Tycho Brahe was the first person to realize we don't measure what's actually happening, there's an error attached. Tycho Brahe was the first person, he didn't call them error, you know, limits, but he knew how precise his abilities were. So the fact that Mars appears to go backwards on its course round uh, the Earth, as he thought at that point, couldn't be accounted for by error, it was real. And then you start thinking about how that is produced as an artifact because both Mars and the Earth go around the Sun. And what kind of circuit does it have to be? Six years he recalculated. Kepler is an absolutely amazing man in, in when you read his story. We would all have given up long before he did. He, God really pushed him to the limits. His church rejected him. His children die. Still held on to his faith. So uh, behind, you know, Kepler's laws, there's a wonderful human story. And Faraday is just extraordinary. And nobody knows Faraday, or very few. Faraday is just, uh, it ought to be required by any decent faculty of education. How many of you know the story of Faraday? Well, I'll do it in 90 seconds. Uh, Faraday you know, was born in London to a very poor family. His father was actually a blacksmith. And his education was largely in the church, where he learned to listen, to think, to read, to write. And by the time he was at 11 or 12, he, he was working as a, a bookbinder, an apprentice. By the grace of God, he had a, a good boss who, who realized this was a smart young man. He said, read the books you're binding as well. And fortunately, there was a lot of science. And he became interested. He started going to the free public lectures at the Royal Society and the Royal Institute. To this day, actually, there's a Christmas lecture for children called the Faraday Lecture. Um, and by the time he was 15, he knew that he did not want to spend his life binding books. What he wanted in our terms was to be the lab tech who set up the experiments to go with the lectures at the Royal Institute. Uh, the, the president at the time uh, was also a, a wonderful Christian man. <sighs> Got name luck. Who made the miner's lamp? Uh, and got about six elements. Anyway, it doesn't matter what his name was, but he was a Christian. And Faraday bound his notes beautifully and trusted them to the post. And this lovely man actually read them and was impressed. And with a few hiccups, he got the job shortly became indispensable because of his brilliant ideas about what should be done next. In due course, he became president of the Royal Institute without ever going to high school. Uh, and he was known to stop its committee meetings so that he could go to his prayer meeting. How many people, kids in high school, know that? I mean, the ones sitting in the back row who 
bailed out, they might be tempted. If he could do that, maybe I could do a bit better. And it would certainly undermine the reflex anti-Christian nonsense that goes on. Uh, Faraday was just a lovely man. He never had children of his own, but his house was always full of children. We, we, you, when you start looking at the people you teach, all the laws that matter to you, and then you go back and you find how many interesting people there are there. There's not a medical student who knows that they all learn the Henderson Hasselbalch equation. None of them know that Henderson was an amazing Christian. And so it goes on. I mean, we have motivation to do these things, don't we? We actually do these things because we're interested. I don't know why one protein got me out of bed for 20 years. No other protein would do it. <laughs> and I was fascinated by the phenomenon before I knew it was a protein. That's what God does to us, doesn't he? Our interests are a gift from God. And we should see them that way. Whatever you do, do heartily as unto the Lord. That's what happens. Many of you, when you think about education, what do most Americans want from the university? What do they want their children to get out of it? They want a job, don't they? That's relevance. And that is not a Christian criterion. It's not bad, but it's not the main one. The, my, the way of making this point, do you, there's a lovely story told of Niels Bohr when the the intellectual feat of the 20th century quantum physics was taking place in the 1920s in, in Europe, in Cambridge, Manchester, and Copenhagen, and other places. Niels Bohr came into a common room one evening looking very happy. And a professor from the English department said, Niels, you look as though you've had a good day. He said, oh, a wonderful afternoon. And he said, well, let me buy you a drink, and you tell me what you've done. And he said, well, I've convinced myself this afternoon that the atom is not the ultimate particle. It can be split. And the professor of English said, and what, pray, is the relevance of that? And Niels Bohr thought for a moment. He said, fortunately, none whatsoever, as far as I can see. <laughs> relevance is not the way you determine what's true. Uh, it was going to be, what, 20 years before Einstein went to your president and said, you've got to make an atom bomb. But Niels Bohr, had made the first step. So for Christians, relevance is not the first criterion. Truth is. And you don't know where that's going to lead you. I mean, the lasers hung around for years. Nobody knew what to do with it. And now you can't do anything without it. <laughs> so they were around for a long while too? Yep. Then we found out we put them in special. Yeah. And they come back. And they come back. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I'm not popular at board meetings. <laughs> because they go like, oh, how are we going to get <clears throat> the students trained so that they can bear the new job requirements? Yeah. And I said, That's not my problem. No. Because you I don't know what the new jobs are going to be? I don't subsidize the education. No. I create good people. Yep. And then I get thrown out. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I, I, I would I would be more subtle and tell the story of Niels Bohr. You have wisdom, I don't. Well, time for you to start learning.